known as the Little Man. Carlos would own a home at 620 Romaine Street in Gretna, Louisiana. In the late 30s to the early 40s, he would also live in an apartment above his liquor store in Algeria. The little man would have an abundance of properties on the West Bank. His father would work at a farm in Myrtle Grove when he first came to the U.S. and would later buy land in Algiers. In the 30s, he would also own a bar in Gretna called the Brown Bomber. The little man was originally laid to rest at Restlawn in Gretna. His remains would later be moved to the Metairie Cemetery. This is the story of Carlos Marcelo, the New Orleans mob boss. Born on February 6, 1910, to Sicilian immigrants Giuseppe and Luigi Minicor in Tunis, French Tunisia. Carlos would immigrate to the United States in 1911 with his family settling in the Cane Plantation House near Metairie in Jefferson Parish, a suburb of New Orleans. His father would adopt a different family name to avoid confusion with his supervisor on a sugar plantation where he had started work. Marcelo would be the chosen name. The family would change all of their names. Calagero Menico would become Carlos Joseph Marcelo. Carlos would have eight siblings, Peter, Rose, Mary, Pascal, Vincent, Joseph Jr., Anthony, and Salvador. In his younger years, Marcelo would turn to petty crimes in the French Quarter. Carlos would later be imprisoned for masterminding a crew of teenage gangsters who carried out robberies in the small town surrounding New Orleans. At the time, local newspaper would compare Marcelo to the character of Fagin from Charles Dickens' novel, Oliver Twist. Marcelo's conviction would later be overturned. The following year, Carlos would be convicted of assault and robbery. He would be sentenced to Louisiana State Penitentiary in West Feliciana Parish. Marcelo would be released after serving five years of the 10-year sentence. In 1938, Marcelo would be arrested and charged with the sale of more than 23 pounds of that Reggie. Marcelo would only serve nine months and be ordered to pay a $400 fine. Upon his release from prison, Marcelo would link up with Frank Costello, the Don of the Genovese crime family in New York City. Costello, at the time, would be involved with the transporting of illegal slot machines from New York to New Orleans. Marcelo would provide the muscle and the range for the slot machines to be placed in local businesses. Frank Costello would learn about Carlos Marcello when he began asking his contacts in Louisiana for the name of a reliable, loyal person who could handle part of his operation on the ground. The fact that Marcello was behind bars would be only a minor inconvenience. Peter Hand, a two-term state legislator who would be eager to help Costello, would put a word in with the governor, allegedly springing Marcello. Carlos would use a jukebox and pinball distribution company that his brother Joe owned. That business would be Jefferson Music Company. Marcello would roll out a few hundred of Costello's machines into the bar in June joints in the French Quarter and in the outskirts of town, including Carcello's own bar, the Brown Bomber. At the end of 1947, Marcello had taken control of Louisiana's illegal gambling network, joining forces with an the crime family associate Meyer Lansky. The two would be tasked with skimming money from some of the most important casinos in the New Orleans area. Marcelo would also earn a cut of the money being skimmed from Las Vegas casinos in exchange for being the muscle in Florida real estate deals. It wouldn't be long before Marcelo would be selected as the godfather of New Orleans Mafia by the family's capos in approval of the commission. This move will be made after deportation of Silvestro Corolla. Marcelo would sit in the seat of Don for the next 30 years. In 1975, during his extortion trial, two witnesses would describe Marcelo as the godfather of the New Orleans Crime Syndicate. Marcelo would appear before the U.S. Sentence Committee on Organized Crime on January 25th of 1951. Carlos would plead the fifth 152 times. Frustrated with Marcelo, the committee would label Carlos as one of the worst criminals in the country. Marcelo would continue the family's long-standing tradition of fierce independence from interference by mafioso in other areas, enacting a policy that would forbid mafioso from other families from visiting Louisiana without first asking permission. On March 24, 1959, Marcelo would again appear before the United States Senate's Committee Against Organized Crime. Serving as chief counsel of the committee would be Robert F. Kennedy. His brother, Senator John F. Kennedy, would also be a member of the committee. In response to committee questioning, Marcelo would again invoke the fifth and refuse to answer any questions relating to his backgrounds, activities, and associates. Marcelo would hate the Kennedys from then 
on out. Carlos Marcelo may have hustled his way to the attention of the big bosses by outsmarting the old men who had been once in control of the gritty, grimy streets of the French Quarter in the port of New Orleans. Maybe it was Pierre Luck. Charles and Antonio Mantrenga had established the New Orleans crime family in 1870. Despite widespread and local national heat, the Matranga crime family would control lucrative rackets for decades, including operations on the New Orleans docks, holes, trafficking, gambling, and bootlegging. Charles would resign the family leadership in 1922. His replacement would be Silver Dollar Corolla. Corolla, who had legal products including busts for narcotics and crushing of federal agents in the 1930s, would eventually be deported in 1947. The rest would be history. The old wives' tale about Marcello feeding his enemies to the gators would come from the fishing and duck hunting trips Carlos would take with people visiting from out of town, aka New York City slickers, who were already primed to be scared to death by the eerie ambience of the Louisiana swamps. New Orleans was the big easy, the city that care for God. Although the U.S. government would beg to differ, Carlos Marcello was definitely from New Orleans. The New Orleans crime family would frequently meet at Mosca's Italian restaurant in Avondale, a building which Marcello owned. On April 4, 1961, the U.S. Justice Department, under the direction of Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, would apprehend Marcellus as he made what he assumed was a routine visit to the immigration authorities in New Orleans. Carlos would be deported to Guatemala. Two months later, Marcello would be back in New Orleans. The man that will fight Marcello's immigration case will be attorney Jack Wasserman. In its 1978 investigation of the deletion of John F. Kennedy, the House Selection Committee on Assassinations will say that it recognized Jack Ruby's slaying of Lee Harvey Walswell as a primary reason to suspect organized crime as possibly having involvement in the deletion. In its investigation, the HSCA will note that the presence of credible associations related to both Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby to figures having a relationship with Marcello's organization. The report will state the committee found that Marcello had the motive, means, and opportunity to have President John F. Kennedy deleted, though it was unable to establish direct evidence of Marcello's involvement. Marcello and his pals would have reason to be angry with Kennedy, whom the mob would help get elected, but would unleash his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, in a crusade against organized crime. It was alleged that Oswald and Ruby had strong ties to Marcello. Frank Regano would say that he relayed a message in 1963 from Teamsters Union leader Jimmy Hoffa to Marcello and Santo Traficante, the mafia boss of Florida, urging the two mafia bosses to crush Kennedy. Regano would later claim that four days before Traficante would pass, he would describe to Regano how he and Marcello organized the crushing of President Kennedy. It was alleged that Marcello arranged for two hitmen to carry out the job after entering the United States from Canada and Europe while setting up Oswald as the fall guy and ordering the subsequent crushing of various conspirators and witnesses who risk turning informants, including Johnny Wasselli and Sam Giacana. Let's rewind. Shortly after Kennedy would be sworn in as president in 1961, Marcello would be deported as an undesirable alien to Guatemala. Marcello would make his way back to the United States. His lawyer would prevent another deportation. In November of 1963, Marcello will be tried for conspiracy to defraud the United States government by obtaining a false Guatemalan birth certificate and conspiracy to obstruct the United States government in the exercise of its right to deport him. Marcello will later be acquitted that same month on both charges. In October of 1964, Marcello will be charged with conspiring to obstruct justice, jury camp, and seeking the deletion of Carl Noe, a government witness. Marcello's attorney would state that if the juror had been bribed, there was no evidence to connect the bribe to Carlos. Noe will refuse to testify against Marcello in the case. Marcello will be acquitted of both charges. In September of 1966, 13 members of New York, Louisiana, and Florida crime families will be arrested for consorting with known criminals at the La Stella restaurant in Queens, New York. Those charges will later be dropped. Returning to New Orleans a few days later, Marcello will be arrested for assaulting an FBI agent. Marcello's first trial will result in a hung jury. Carlos will be retried and convicted. Carlos would serve six months of the two-year sentence. In 1981, Marcello, R.D.W. Young, and two other men will be indicted in U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Louisiana. 
in New Orleans with conspiracy, racketeering, mail, and wire fraud, and his scheme to bribe state officials to give the five men multi million dollar insurance contracts. The charges will be the result of a federal bureau investigation probe known as Brylab. Isaac Irving Davidson was a mover and a shaker in Washington, D.C., as well as a close friend of Marcello. Carlos would give him the nickname Uncle Snookums. Isaac would make contact with the con man, Joseph Hauser of Los Angeles, a convicted felon who was operating as an insurance broker. Davidson would introduce Hauser to Carlos in June of 1976. Hauser, looking to capitalize, would be anxious to expand his business interests into Louisiana. Carlos would make phone calls, resulting in Hauser getting access to all the insurance business from the Building Trade Union. Hauser would also gain lucrative contracts with the Teamsters and Longshoremen Union for a fee of $250,000. Hauser would leverage this business through an insurance company he purchased in New Orleans using Carlos as the go-between. The jig was up by the end of 1978. Hauser would himself be in deep trouble. The SEC would place his company under receivership regarding irregularities in the way the business was set up. In addition, Hauser and Davidson would be indicted on federal racketeering charges in February of 1979. Hauser will plead guilty, agreeing to work with the government to pop Marcello. The sting operation against Marcello will begin April 2nd of 1979. In 1979, Carlos, for the first time ever, will be caught on the wire, admitting that he was a part of the mafia. The FBI will launch two operations against Marcello, both of which succeeded and resulted in lengthy prison sentences, effectively taking down his criminal enterprise. Hauser, aided by two undercover FBI agents, will set themselves up as representatives of a fictitious West Coast insurance company. Hauser and the FBI agents will wear wires, and Marcello's office at the Town & Country Motel complex would be bugged. The operation had been underway about six months when Hauser, in one of his many conversations with Carlos, would pick Marcello up on the wire, saying, I'm doing this for the friends of mine in California. They are mafia like me, you know? personal friends. The men Marcello will be referring to were the leaders of the Los Angeles Mafia. Boss Dominic Brooklier and his underboss Sam Sigurtiano, a couple called Mike Rizzitello, and three top soldiers in the West Coast arm of the mob. They had all been indicted on federal racketeering charges in February of 1979, largely on the evidence of former capo Jimmy the Weasel Fatiano, who would become an informant. Ferry Brooklier had put a hit out on him. The undercover FBI agents, along with Hauser, would convince Marcello that they could set up the judge in the forthcoming trial of the six men, provided Carlos could provide a suitable favor in return. On November 1st, the FBI would bug Carlos's office, recording him confirming with Hauser that he would guarantee the $125,000 that had been agreed upon to bribe Judge Ferguson. On June 17, 1980, Carlos Marcello along with three other men, will be indicted by a federal grand jury for 12 counts of racketeering in the Bride Lab case. On August 5, 1981, Carlos will be indicted by a Los Angeles federal grand jury for conspiring to bribe a United States district judge. Carlos would not be concerned about his trial in New Orleans. He had always beaten the feds in New Orleans. Carlos would arrogantly say to a news reporter, They not gonna get me, man. No way, man. D are my people here. But Los Angeles was a different story. That was the one to fear. As it turned out, they would both shaft him. U.S. District Judge Maury Sear would allow the admission of secretly recorded conversations that he claimed demonstrated corruption at the highest level of state and government. Marcello would be convicted. In 1989, Marcello would suffer a series of strokes. In July, in a surprise move, the fifth U.S. District Court of Appeals would throw out Marcello's bribe lab conviction. One judge would deny this reversal. His decision would be overruled. In October, after having served six years and six months on the sentence, Marcello would be released. Carlos Marcello would pass March 2, 1993. This was the story of Carlos' little man, Marcello. The Ninth Ward, Eighth Ward, Seventh Ward, Sixth Ward, Fifth Ward, Fourth Ward, and Third Ward are seven of the wards that make up the city of New Orleans. In 1852, most of the boundaries that make up the first through 11 wards will be recognized and set forth into one centralized government. It wouldn't be until the expansion of the city in 1870 that the other wards would be formed. Originally created for political reasons that have been replaced by council districts, the wards still hold a lot of meaning for neighborhood identities within the city. The wards are divided by those that are uptown and by those that are downtown. By the 1980s, with the uprise of bounce music, there will be a rise in the use of wards as a means of identification. Artists from different parts of the city will put their wards 
on the map. Most of the urban slangs being used globally now all originated from New Orleans. Twerk, hot boy, hot girl, yeah with the yeah, get it how you live, go with the move, out my top, just to name a few. Two of the most notable music labels with hell from the N.O., Cash Money and No Limit Records. Cash Money will go on to be recognized as the biggest rap label in the music industry. Second Lines, Mardi Gras Indians, and Block Parties, aka DJs, are all part of New Orleans culture. Not to be overshadowed by hip hop, New Orleans is also home of jazz music. With many visitor attractions such as the French Quarter, St. Charles Avenue, and Magazine Street, making New Orleans one of the top most visited cities in the United States of America. Unlike any other city, New Orleans is in the shape of a bow and below sea level, making a city vulnerable to hurricanes and floods. New Orleans has oftentimes been referred to as the melting pot of the South due to its multicultural residence. Born in the Dominican Republic, Richard Reyes Pina would immigrate to the United States by way of Puerto Rico. Pina, who would have a hard Dominican accent, came up in Avondale and Oswego. It is this strong accent that would later earn him one of his nicknames, the Cuban. Fast forward to 1990, Pina is already pumping weight using his legit company, Gator Collision, as a front. It wouldn't be until 1993 that Pina would have his first encounter with the feds. A sting operation had been set up for Pina to cop 100 chickens. Realizing that it was a setup, Pina would not go through with the purchase. That same year, 1993, Richard Curtis, who had just come home from doing a seven-year bid in Angola, would jump back in the game. Richard had got put on, and his connect was the truth. Looking to legitimize himself and wash his money at the same time, Richard would open Funland Game Room off of Washington and Claiborne in uptown New Orleans, along with a legitimate trucking company. It's 1995. Richard, who had been home for two years now, was pumping that weight and copped the new Lexus. This would alert the wolves. Richard would be followed and apprehended by corrupt NOPT officer David Singleton, who would turn him over to Richard Pina. Pina, who had given Rich an ultimatum, wasn't having it. The rest would be history. Richard's dismembered body parts would later be found. Pina would be involved in several different incidents that would transpire before the abduction and crushing of Richard Curtis. At about 10 p.m. on September the 28th, 1991, the NOPD would respond to gunfire at the intersections of Carrollton and Ahart. Two vehicles would be pulled over, one of which was a truck being driven by Richard Pina. Pina, who was wearing a bulletproof vest, would be arrested. $25,000 in cash would be confiscated by the NOPD. November 11, 1993, Pina would pay $12,000 in cash for a Sea Ray Sundancer. In June of 93, Pina, Roger Schmidt, Brian Lott, and Mitch Harden would form a promotional company, All Together Entertainment which they would later use to bring Tupac Shakur to the city. In August of 93, Pina and his sister would launch Crystal Ink, which would fly under the flag of Pina's altogether entertainment. In May of 93, the Latin nightclubs Bocaccio 2000 and CIMA would be opened by Pina's sister. In May of 95, $600,000 will be seized from Beverly Ann Harrison, an alleged courier for Pina. In August of 95, Pina would launch Sheska Records, named after his daughter, Francesca. On January 6, 1996, Pina and Mitch would bring Tupac to the city of New Orleans to perform at the Superdome. This was a major concert which steppers and hustlers from every hood would attend. 
Singleton, who was already under scrutiny by the feds, would be acquitted in 1991 on federal charges of shaking down drug dealers. The year before napping Richard Curtis, Singleton would nap Bavari Harvey and deliver him to Pina. Singleton would be involved with taking the life of Robin Petrie in 1997, an alleged government informant. Roger Schmidt would also be crushed. On April 17, 1997, Pina will be arrested with three of his workers in Diamond Head, Mississippi for various drug trafficking offenses. July 17, 1998, the grand jury will return a 14-count third superseding indictment against Pina. Charges will be one count of engaging in a continual criminal enterprise, two counts of conspiracy to possess controlled substances with the intent to distribute, six counts of taking the life of a human, two counts of conspiracy to take the life of a human, one count of using a telephone to facilitate the commission of a drug trafficking offense, and one counting to launder money. Pina, aka the Ghost, aka the Cuban, will continue to run his operation from behind the walls of OPP. Trained to violence, Pina would develop a sophisticated system of communication using trustees, inmates, and 12 Sheriff Foley deputies. Pina's jailhouse maneuvers were result of a war between rival dealers in the city. On June 9th, one of the most loved, feared, and respected men in the city, Randall Watts, aka Slim, would lose his life. During an executed search of a Waveland, Mississippi hotel room rented by Pina's wife, the feds will recover two suitcases and a duffel bag filled with more than $400,000. One of the whips that were searched would allegedly produce a Glock 40, 25 racks, and a handwritten ledger. Troy Watts, aka T Dub, will be dragged into Pena's indictment without a shred of concrete evidence. Prosecutors would use the ledger and testimony from Pena to convict T Dub. It was alleged that T Dub was copying two bricks a month and getting another two on consignment. July 4th, 1997, T Dub will be picked up by the feds and the NOPD. Without a lot of hard evidence, the feds will rely heavily on the notes in the alleged handwritten ledger. It is this that they were used to be led to six people that allegedly bought birds from Pina. Four of six people would be involved in the entertainment business and were indicted on drug conspiracy charges on March 25th. Ian Dillon, who incorporated a record label with Pina, Roderick Adams, co-owner of Big Time Tiffs Bar and Lounge, Sean Martin, co-owner of Treme Music Hall, and Donnell Carroll Jr. The other two suspects will be Daniel and David Garcia, Cain and Abel from Master P's No Limit Record. DEA agents will pop up on the twins at their crib in Baton Rouge. The twins have been given a choice, implicate Master P or face indictment on narcotics conspiracy charges. The twins' motion will be brought before a New Orleans federal judge on July 21st, arguing that on March 24th, Federal agents asked the twins to be their eyes and ears and cooperate in an investigation against Master P or face indictment. The twins refused, saying that they knew nothing of any relationship between P and Pina. Cain and Abel, who met Pina while studying at Xavier University, would later be sentenced to three years for misimprisonment of a felony. Mm -hmm.